Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Matt. Uh, and this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. Um, I some tonight we might actually be in the air for a little bit of the topics. That's not Ooh. technically on road, it's still off. It's any anyway. Uh, we're socially distanced. It's the only way we do the podcast. We did it before it was cool or mandated. Uh, I'm matters. still in the Midwest. Ross is still in the Northeast, and Matt's in Arizona. So we're back to multiple time zone spread. <laughs> Always fun to talk into the future and into the past. Well, and Dude. and you guys are about to flip flop time zones, right? Uh, probably. Well, actually, I think Arizona is weird. I think they just don't recognize daylight savings, so everything else changes, but Arizona just stays the same. It's, right. It's, I just thought you guys just hop between Mountain and Pacific time zone for the entire state and just don't care. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. I, I have not figured it out yet. My my favorite was uh, in October of last year, driving from Arizona or driving from Utah, fifteen minutes south into Arizona and losing an hour. <laughs> <laughs> not a very economic drive. I was like, if you're going no. east or west, I understand it, but I went south. Like that's yeah. that was odd. Anyway, uh, we should probably start with news. I, it's usually, usually where we get, we jump from. Yeah. So I had I threw this link in here just because I saw it today, and I I think I saw it actually on like a Porsche LinkedIn post, which tells you how my day went. I I work in marketing, so it makes sense for me to be in there. Um, well, it, this also comes from Porsche's own newsroom. Like yes. this isn't just some third party that's right. out in the middle of nowhere doing their own shtick. Yeah. So Porsche is teamed up with a lady from Colorado. I actually did a little research on her. Uh, her, name is, her name is Renee. I don't know how to pronounce the accent correctly or not. Um, You're good. Yeah. But she has traveled with a 1956 356A. Yeah, 356A. Mm -hmm. And raced in Peking to Paris. Uh, East Africa, classic safari or east africa safari classic rally what a they get classic in there uh and then she also did la, la carrera pan america all in this 356 porsche same which basically means every continent that's amazing mm -hmm. except did she do australia uh she said she's done see in australia she's got one final landmass to check off and that's what this car is prepped for now which is actually what made me stop and oogle all of this because this 356 looks unlike any other 356 I've ever seen. It's, and for the audio listener, yeah. it has skis and tracks. It's definitively bonkers. And it also has some kind of like brush guard jumping apparatus hanging off the front, presumably. You, so like if you hit <laughs> some snow, it just skips it instead of what it's like think? a stinger bumper that's filled in i would say is that what they call it on a, on a wrangler when it's out like that is it a uh -huh. stinger bumper stinger. Yeah. yeah that seems like it makes sense i don't know if you if you hit like a snow bank it keeps you on top is that yeah the idea? that's exactly so that's definitely what it looks like there's during, a big old skid underneath there yeah during lunch today i actually like went through and read a lot of this they didn't give us a lot of like technical specifics to like did they <laughs> increase horsepower or anything like that but the skis are designed to take like 40 to 50% of the weight to keep it all spread out and keep it up. And then they went through and tried to like lighten it as much as possible because they're terrified about sinking into the snow. So the thing on the front is really about keeping the nose up mm -hmm. uh, and not losing it. So she, they're headed down to Antarctica with this thing. The uh, Tuthill Porsche out of the UK, who has... I, think that's all they do is is rally prep porsches yep. um they did all of the engineering behind this uh and then some famous british explorer is going with her who's done multiple trips across the antarctic and so she only has to drive i think it's like 300 miles i gotta only across antarctica and, yeah and <laughs> one mile there is more difficult than most of the stuff that anybody on or listening to the show has ever done so it's it's 356 miles so ah halfway to denver for me like it's is really there, <laughs> does she have a uh a i didn't get to read this ahead of time but does she have a team like a support team of any kind so they don't talk about a support team okay. i'm assuming somebody's going to follow them 
Yeah, I would hope mm-hmm. so for her well-being. Like, yeah. not that I don't think she's capable, but man, that's like, it's kind of an ambitious pursuit. Well, and they're headed down in like a couple of weeks. Like they're, they're planning to start on December 5th in Antarctica. Like that's... we're closing, like the 20, was it the 21st is the, the solstice? That's the darkest mm-hmm. day of the year for them. And she's driving this thing. Mm. like across antarctica for yep it's really crazy looking at the other pictures in the press release of the car on street tires you know with like straps holding the the frunk closed and and rally lights and everything and just normal toe points and then you look at the pictures of it prepped for this this i don't even know if adventure is the right word for it but it's, it makes me think of, um, you know, like some of the Land Rovers that were outfitted with tracks to drive across snow. I mean, it's like so cool. It's extreme. So yes, yeah. the uh, bonkers. the Explorer that's going with or I'm going to ruin his name because he's got a day as a middle name, but it's <laughs> Jason Cart- Carteret, Cartier. I don't know. So but he's he's her navigator, but he's been a part of more than 50 expeditions to the North Pole and to the South Pole. So some reference to somebody. Sounds um, like the right person to have navigating for you. <laughs> yeah. Turn left at that iceberg. <laughs> iceberg dead ahead. Iceberg. So <laughs> Things you don't want to hear when you're traversing Antarctica. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's technically what most of Antarctica is. It's not I guess actual landmass. Like also it's... better than iceberg. You already crashed into it. <laughs> right. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting and for the audio listener, please Google the Porsche 356 that's about to go across the Antarctic because the images are amazing. Uh, they are they're so so good. Yep. Um, the next piece of news, uh, Ross found this one. I was <laughs> doing my normal weird doings on tire rack and happened to find that the GMC Hummer EV's tire sizes have been unintentionally released. So if you go on tire rack and just punch in the way you go about things, you know, year, make, model, blah, blah, blah. You can actually put in a 2024 GMC Hummer EV. And the tire size that they have listed is 305 55 25 as the standard size. And they are recommending as a replacement because they currently have nothing in stock that, that actually is of that uh, horrible, horrible size. Uh, they say 305 70, 18 is as close as they can get you, which I mean, like that's, that's a bunch of tire. That's uh, yeah. A, a pretty appreciable amount of, of well, rubber for, and wheel for 9,000 pounds of vehicle at two. Do and they have and to what, be like 10,000 10, foot pounds of torque or something like that. Uh, that's uh, what they, Tell. What's the actual that's number? That's, that's the market. market. I don't market know. Really. These like electric <laughs> vehicle conversions are always confusing and strange. Yeah. Well, John, Johnny Lieberman put out on his Instagram today, the new Z06 engine with its 670 horsepower and how, and it was a cutaway and it was massive. And then they had the lucid air engine and a carry on size suitcase yeah. that is also supposed to make 670 horsepower. Mm-hmm. And one was, per axle. Yeah, and it, and that has yeah one per axle in in the vehicle, so it's just so uh, just for conversion's sake. So a three hundred five fifty five twenty two is thirty five point two tall, twelve wide. That's God. that's some tire, definitely some tire for a twenty two inch wheel. So it's a foot in width. It's gonna be a hundred and twenty pounds a corner. Wow, well, that's that's minuscule, minuscule compared to nine thousand <laughs> yeah. pounds. <laughs> I guess when you have a quoted 10,000 on the torque scale and uh, whatever scale they're using and uh, yeah. And 9,000 or 9,500 pounds with somebody driving it, that means nothing, but yeah. So anyways, moving on me. Yeah. Meanwhile, at like BFG, it's like, guys, guys, we need, we need to make sizes that no, you know, what's going to happen in like 10 years. It's going to be like when people try to get tires for the, um, for the, lmo2 oh and they have to do like a a production run (laughs) we're gonna run these for six months and then everybody buys spares 
you're going to have to get them in 10 years. You have to do a, a garage edition just to store all your spares for, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, for your sure. other sets of tires. Which that, that leads me to the point that Matt Farah, the smoking tire, makes all the time is like, tires go bad with time as well. Yep. Like it's, it's an tires. actual chemical reaction that's happening all the time. So just letting them sit there doesn't help. Nobody's better. You need to get a really big one of those vacuum stu- food storage systems. <laughs> yes. Put all in a hefty bags and air seal. Yes. Where you put the vacuum on it and suck the air out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's just do that to the entire yeah. garage. Let's just yeah. do it. <laughs> we'll biodome uh, our tires in. Yeah, our, our garage is climate controlled. Well, our our garage is vacuum packed. <laughs> Instead of a uh, cigar humidor, it's a tire humidor. Yes, oh, that'd be fantastic. Man. Hey, Shark Tank isn't that much of a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. That's how we all make our first million. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, speaking of first, um, first, first millions, first, first fi- <laughs> they might make a million off it. I don't know. They're going to make 50 of them. Oh, they'll make a million off of that. Literally, as I was prepping the show tonight and in between like the end of the workday and getting into this, uh, Ford released, like they kind of teased it earlier in the day. And it was just something in the dirt doing donuts. And I didn't really understand what it was, but, uh, then they put out the press release for the Ford Bronco Desert Racer. They were calling it the DR earlier in the day. Um, but they're going to make 50 of these things available late 2022, just in time for the 2023 Baja 1000. Does right. that normally so, mean January? Was there any information about if it's like if Ford themselves are campaigning the vehicles or if you're, it's like, so these you buy are, it and they not, you're on your own. These are also, customer Chris, vehicles. We can, we can see your screen again. Um, the yeah, notes again, I'm switching back and forth. Don't <laughs> share settings. So they're customer vehicles. So the customers take delivery of it and then they have to have their own source for prepping them, maintaining them, delivering them to the which wherever it is. I'll point out on the image I have shared, those are BFG race tires, which means you're then, if you buy your race tires from BFG, you remember when we had. Frank and Matt and all those guys who mm-hmm. used to work at BFG, they're now part of the pit system yep. for BFG if you buy your race tires from them. So as a privateer, you buy your truck from Ford, you buy your tires from BFG, let's go run a Baja. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I, mean, I may have neglected like 750 grand somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. And uh, does it say anything about the chassis or the price? Didn't say anything about chassis. Didn't say anything about price. It said 400 horsepower Coyote V8. So okay. this is a V8 Bronco, which we all expect is coming with the Bronco R anyway. Uh, and it did say Multimatic Positional Selected DSSV dampers, mm-hmm. which didn't we just talk about that last week with the brand new Sierra AT4X? Yep. And the Silverado ZR2. So uh, awesome shocks. Yeah. Which Good work. Yeah, maybe I need to put those on the spur. No, I don't need. To. Yeah, that'll cost you more than a suburban. <laughs> <laughs> Christ, I can dream. You can uh, dream. I think that's all it said was um, it got a horse. I got a horsepower number. I got a limited run of fifty, uh, and I knew it was a V eight. And then I kind of bounced out of it to go plan other stuff. Oh, roll uh, safety cage. So you should pass tech. Um, this is like the gentleman razors dream it, it's here. the off-road gentleman dream. racers wet dream you yep. don't have to pay wide open baja anymore yep. you can just yep if anybody's looking to run in the nora or anything like that this is the ticket and uh and you don't have to deal with anything that starts with eco and ends with boost uh hold on this Holding says on. the starting price is in the mid two hundred thousand dollar range oh hi <laughs> well hey, I- you know, only 50 it's collectible. That seems incredibly yeah. cheap to me as a race truck. Mm. Is it though? <laughs> Cause like aren't full fledged trophy trucks, like two fifty four. I'm for the audio four. listener. I'm shaking my head. No, yeah, I just <laughs> somebody, who was I listening to? Um, it might've been smoking tire with Forsberg on, and they were talking about some, race vehicles being uh one two now like one point one to two, two. Good one God. one point two not not oh. 800 grand more than that but still like it doesn't matter at that point i i think they were talking about 
somebody's trophy truck being one one point two. Anyways, uh, let's talk about <laughs> things that us mortals can afford. Well, so I'm testing a new Ranger. I, well, real fast, I just want to make this point. If that's two hundred thousand dollars, that's a steal. Not only is the gentleman racer going to buy it, he's going to buy one for his buddies now. Like, there are going to be multiple teams sure. of those. Those are ridiculous. I did they, did they provide any details about if it's a standard duty coyote or is it like a beefed up race coyote where like it's got you know a hundred hour life on the top end and you have to rebuild the thing so you get four-door frame adding unique body and chassis modifications for high-speed desert racing plus a coyote that is targeting more than 400 that's all we got how it makes 480 in the mustang Right. So, but if they're targeting more than 400, but want to make sure it's reliable for all thousand miles, lower your horsepower a little bit, a little bit more yes, reliability. Yeah. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. Anybody else running 400 horsepower in that wheelbase of a truck? Anything with an LS. <laughs> that you had hey, to build? That, guy. Hey, that you that had guy. to build? Yeah, probably. Probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. I, Chevy I'm, Blazer. <laughs> There are some amazing pre-runners that guys have made out of old blazers. Can you imagine the current Chevy Blazer, though, with like an LS and, and a full race truck spec? Oh, that would be so not. funny. Front wheel drive. So, <laughs> I will let you move on to the topic you wanted to talk about, though, which is oh, I don't, I don't have much to comment other than for the first time in 10 years, there's going to be a new Ranger. The, just a reminder to everybody, the Ranger that we have here currently has kind of been in global production since like 2010 or 2011 so so when i was in dearborn in 2012 2013 there were mm -hmm. global rangers running around the proving grounds and that was the thing that everybody was focused on because that we didn't get it we didn't care about the new the the last of the 62 raptors that we were dealing with or whatever we wanted to, or the eco boost fiestas we want to go watch these rangers running around and they wouldn't let us because <laughs> we didn't well, get we eventually yeah well we did in what 2018 yeah and so it feels like it's only been here for a little bit but the truck itself is is incredibly ancient. old it's ancient and if you get in one like yeah they drive fun but they feel old there's no way around that so so it's an updated look coming similar to the maverick front end is the way i kind of look at it it's kind of all truck front Actually, ends, I, ford. yeah pretty much every ford want to be four by four or four by four is going to look like that that isn't a bronco yeah so. so it looks relatively the same in size like a, we're, we've moved some styling cues around i guess i i got nothing my phone has scanned the qr code that you brought up which <laughs> brings you to media.ford.com yep uh and then asks you if you want to accept cookies and yep. uh yeah new ford I've ranger to be revealed soon so I accept, accept numerous cookies already just going back and forth to the media site. So uh, it looks fine. It looks like it's going to be a four Ranger. Yeah. We are going to want to drive them just like everybody else. <laughs> the Ranger hasn't really taken off in the overlanding community the way a lot of people expected it to, but it, it's still, it's a fine vehicle. It's fine. It's fine. I, have, I have very limited experience behind the wheel of that truck. We had an AR, like a fully kitted out, ranger from arb that was pretty mm -hmm. cool um i got to drive around a little bit but you know that's a far cry from what you get when you order it from the factory right <laughs> yeah anything arb <laughs> touches is bound to be a little uh a little cared for <laughs> but that's a fancy truck what the arb one yeah i, I googled fast can you can you uh oh i'm, I'm getting there I guess. share with the class click, chris click 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 click, get it, click. just give me a second like, look, look at him. That thing is fucking rad. Although <laughs> the propane tank on the roof is like 5% questionable. Um. <laughs> my, my favorite part is somebody on the internet is going to ask them why the propane tank on the roof is mounted next to their machine gun. Because <laughs> everybody thinks a high lift jack is a machine gun. It's a flamethrower, okay? <laughs> <laughs> pew, pew. <laughs> it is mounted immediately next to the gas tank, though. The jerry can. <laughs> yep. But this looks like some of those stuff they got running around in Australia, though, like with the um, the tube bumper ordeal on the side. Oh, yeah. The bull bar extensions. Yeah, the extensions. 
that that's a cool truck though. Yeah, yeah, it's it's got a lot of things squeezed yeah. into it. It ha- has a air, it had the air lockers at you know hmm. whole nine yards. Onboard air. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, air. So we could phone. believe it we, or not. It has the air be catalog is what you're saying because there's a snorkel, <laughs> there's a deluxe bull bar with the side extensions, there's a worn <laughs> winch, there's a front skid plate, there's a tow yep. hook, there's a roof rack. Is that some is stealth that their, LED light up there? Is that their modular roof rack? Mm, good question. I don't remember. Probably might, pro- it, the answer is probably might be just about <laughs> everything. It's got the LED lights on the front. Like it's got it looks it's fantastic. The, uh, accessory stickers on the windshield. Yeah, no, kit it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I don't want my truck to look like, but I do want my truck to look like. <laughs> it's a, it's a cool rig. <laughs> it does. So, anyways, Chris, you have any updates of your own? So I spent some time browsing. So to fill you in, Matt, I have a 2017 Suburban that we bought because we have way too many kids. Okay. Um, again, <laughs> entirely our fault. Like it's all self-responsibility. I'm aware of the situation. I mean, that's the um, right car if you've got a family to tote around, right? And, and we had an 08 Sequoia that I started to like outfit for off-road stuff, but literally I need more space. And so we got a, a Yakima Skybox uh, that goes on top both is that where the extra suburban. kids go i yes. haven't i they only if they're not active. there are two middles that would love enough. to ride up there but i won't let them. <laughs> um because they think it for them it's like it's extreme and i'm like for me it's quiet like it's the, the, <laughs> uh and also uh, it's a loss. lawsuit <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but i bought a premiere edition so like it's got 22s which drive me nuts it's got this the lower valence that all gm trucks have well, not anymore MPG. well <laughs> i trimmed an inch off the bottom and ross i hadn't heard it scrape until the other day reversing out i heard even the trimmed ones start to scrape and i'm like you out mother- of your own driveway no uh, uh it, was, it was off a curb like it was it was the place uh, where it used to do it all the time mm-hmm. because it's so long. So you're like, Oh, I have to pull all the way in as possible. And then you hit the curb and you're like, Oh my God, it's driving me nuts. <laughs> so yeah. I, I did. Yeah. That that's probably where anyway, <laughs> GM makes. So my bumper is the bumper cover for with the non off-road package or without off-road package. Well, they make a bumper cover with the off-road package and it doesn't have all of that air dam at the bottom it's all mm-hmm. it's like manufactured the way it's supposed to it's almost five hundred dollars it's not that bad it feels that bad <laughs> well it feels you can, that bad. yeah okay fair. <laughs> it just it i will in time figure something out the leveling kit probably comes first because you can probably get a leveling kit installed for a couple hundred bucks you can buy one it's for just torsion keys yeah or you can no, do it yourself the, in the driveway. I've got the Magna Red stuff, so it's like you need the oh, brackets. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, I always forget about that. It's all right. It rides nice. Um, so I, I do need to get the brackets and raise the front end like an inch and a half, which would then eliminate any, like if it's scraping an inch and a half, like I'm up on a rock. So that's on me at that point. Um, so I'm probably not going to pursue the $500 bumper cover. I'll probably pursue a front end leveling kit. Uh, I started to look at tow hooks today too. And like the difference between black and chrome was ridiculous. <laughs> like the black ones were like 60 bucks. The chrome ones were like 300 bucks. I'm like, well, I guess we're going with black ones. Like, yeah, I why would literally, you want a chrome? I don't. <laughs> I, I, it was just more the juxtaposition of the different prices. Was this, fun. this reminds me of our Ram that we got this year, which because we got a dealer ordered truck, it had to have chrome because you can't find a dealer ordered truck without chrome at the tradesman mm. level. <laughs> and we immediately went and started pulling all the chrome off, which we paid extra <laughs> for, for some reason. So, uh-huh. right. so you paid extra for chrome that you then had to pay extra to make black. Yeah. <laughs> much. yeah. So were your, were your door handles and everything chrome? No, thank goodness. It's, okay. it's just like the grill surround and the bumper okay. and yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's actually, I mean, that those, those are the new bumpers. So we got rid of a very large piece of chrome right there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the hope is to, to get rid of, to, I just want black plastic. I don't want like yep. something that's going to give me a migraine if it catches the sunlight just the right oh way. Oh my God. Or the as the glare off that shit is the worst. As you're trying to take images of your vehicle. You're like, Oh, now I got to move <laughs> four feet to the left because this, I will, gone. I will say, I think on the white truck, the white truck is probably the one that's the least offensive when it's paired with chrome. You know, yeah. it's not like a red truck with chrome. Or, right. Right. Well, yeah, it's the know. it's the least 
like gap between the colors, you know, (laughs) you know, she should, uh, Hey shit. A a can of spray paint's real cheap. Yeah. Right. Sandpaper and spray paint are really cheap. Yeah. So Matt, for you, this is what the suburban looks like. Sand. Oh, nice. I did trim an inch here. Okay. (laughs) So, but I have spent some time recently uh, browsing Facebook marketplace for Chevy 18 inch wheels. And I, based on those are 22s on there. Those are 22s. They don't even look that big. Yeah. That just speaks to the size of the vehicle. (laughs) Like it's, it's such a, it doesn't drive like a big truck. It's this generation. When I hop in the Sequoia, I feel like I'm like up on top of the Sequoia. And when I hop back in this, I feel like I sit down in the suburban. So I don't feel Mm -hmm. like I'm driving this 6,000 pound truck. I just feel like I'm driving. It really feels like I'm driving a large sedan, which is, I think it's probably more about my odd perspective than actual, the size of the vehicle. Like, Cause it's fucking huge. Like it's, GM also <laughs> has good chassis engineers. Yeah. Uh, so I do think my plan is to pursue some Chevy 18 inch wheels. It looks like I could get some reasonably priced, maybe less than a bumper cover. And it looked like from what I saw browsing local cra- uh, Facebook, marketplace i could probably sell my 22s for more than i would buy the 18s oh just, for sure then i Is just the need difference a, enough to get the bumper cover no it's not right. enough to get the bumper cover it's yeah not, it's not even enough to find like some good rubber for two of the new wheels like <laughs> i need I, I need a tire sponsor is what I need. yokohama call me um <laughs> I would, yeah so anyway that's that's my update i I, I've been teasing it for weeks that we talk about leveling kit and stuff and it just we'll probably keep talking about it. It's just it's I it's got Michelins on it and they're fairly new and I'm like it's a really good tire. It's going to be safe all the time. I can't really the way it's set up. I can't I, I can't go get there's no articulation in it whatsoever right now. I'm going to scrape everything. I need to just get it a little lift and get it a little little Black little Friday is just around the corner. Do what? Black Friday is just around the corner. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Some kids. It's that time <laughs> of year for them. Oh, true. Fair they point. Don't, Fair luckily, point. they don't really listen to the podcast, but. Uh, <laughs> so, Matt, let's talk um, about your stuff. <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of exciting we, shit First of all, on. we haven't introduced Matt from where he is and what he does. So, hmm. do you want to give a quick elevator pitch on, like, resume? <laughs> Um, yeah, like what I'm currently doing, or I, I have like a really weird, long history of work stuff that oh. doesn't follow any kind of past path. and present. You're talking to a former middle school teacher who works in marketing for an industrial distributor right now. You can oh. go. <laughs> All right. Just I am. We're good. <laughs> well, I guess here I'll start with where I'm at now. So I'm a senior editor with Expedition Portal and Overland Journal, which is, um, as, as far as I know, it's like the premier publication for overland travel. The magazine's been around for uh, a while now, I want to say mm-hmm. 15 years. Um, and it's beautiful. It's, it's a super cool project to be a part of and to get to contribute to. And then Expedition Portal has been around, around I think, as long. Um, really fun website. Uh, it's a little broader in scope than the magazine is. You know, we cover all sorts of stuff, auto news four-wheel drive, overland, um, general travel stuff too. I mean, I like to I like to say that overland travel is not just vehicle-based, even though I think a lot of people would argue, no, overland travel is vehicle-based mm-hmm. travel. But, you know, like we've got motorcycle stuff. Um, we've got a great bikepacking editor who has some bikepacking content on here. Um, more about the stories even than the vehicles. What's that? It's more about the stories even than the vehicles themselves. They're just oh, kind that's- of- absolutely i mean like means by which shit happens yeah and i i totally agree i think you know it's it's that is a really good thing to point out i think a lot of people get hyper focused on the vehicle and like that becomes like that's their thing that they're focused on and it's like no the vehicle enables crazy shit you know like you can Mm -hmm. go and have some pretty wild adventures if you have the right vehicle you know you don't need to go out and buy a two hundred thousand dollar vehicle to travel around the world because you've just spent more money than you even 
could possibly need to travel around. Like, you know, go buy the $10,000 vehicle and drive around the world for, you know, under 50 grand or something mm-hmm. like that for a few years. Um, but I'm, anyway, I'm, yeah. So, I'm leaning so, more and more towards shitbox. Yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> Comfortable shitbox, but still shitbox. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I'm doing now. Um, but, oh, man, I mean, I, you know, like back in... Back in high school, I, I really got into photography. So that's kind of where my, my love of photography began. And that's been kind of a constant through a lot of my work. I used to shoot weddings. Um, you know, I, I've always tried to keep a camera at handy just because it's so much fun. Um, but so I, I've done some photography work like uh, in ad agencies in LA and some photo research on some ad campaigns for some weird stuff like the, the iPhone uh, the shot on iPhone campaign where I was basically yeah. finding images that people created with iPhones and we were, you know, contacting the photographers and putting together this ad campaign around that. Um, I wasn't the creative director on that, but I got to enjoy searching for that stuff. Um, I worked as a wildland firefighter for a couple seasons in Colorado. Uh, I worked as an interpretive ranger for the forest service. Uh, Jeez. I ran a commercial marijuana grow in Boulder for a couple of years. Um, uh what else i used to be like a camp instructor like i i like how i just juxtaposed camp instructor to commercial marijuana grower but uh that was done unintentionally but yeah no um, you can still be a good person <laughs> and do both like, <laughs> of course of seriously. course uh it but uh legal. yeah no i i, all I used to lead like groups of high school kids um on bike trips so like one of the biggest trips i did with them we we had a group of 12 kids and we did uh, a cross country bike ride from Georgia to California in six weeks, um, self supported from wait from miles. where to where in six weeks. Yeah. So we started on Tybee Island in Georgia and we rode through like, you know, across the country. So it was 3000 miles, nice. um, in six oh weeks. Yeah. God. Finished on Santa Monica pier. Oh, well, that sounds cool. fantastic. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> Multiple was absolutely great. hundred miles a day does not. <laughs> and um, and yeah, and, and also I did some rock climbing and ice climbing guiding when I was in college, uh, I've worked for ski patrol as a dispatcher. I mean, like you name it, if there's a job that has like some romantic appeal to it and that I think I might be interested in it, like I've pursued it at some point. Mm-hmm. So what's, what's been your uh, biggest, grandest adventure? Oh man. Um, <laughs> coming out with the hard hitting ones. stuff. Yeah, I would say so. Probably my my biggest adventure, if if you can call it one adventure, is uh, it was two uh, two thousand fifteen, I think. Um, my my now partner and I uh, had like connected at Burning Man, and she was leaving a career in tech in San Francisco, and. Um, I had just moved to California. I had just gotten laid off and divorced. And so we were both in like this big transitional phase of our lives. And mm-hmm. we were, neither of us really wanted like real jobs at the time. We were just like, we just need a break. Um, and so we decided to go to South America for three and a half months, um, and without an agenda or a return ticket. So we basically flew into Quito in Ecuador and, had like the first couple of days planned out. We had a friend of a friend who agreed to accommodate us and kind of get our trip started. Yes, we and um, on couch. yeah, yeah, we had a couch to sleep on, and uh, and then that was it. We spent three and a half months, and we we started in Ecuador, and we did the whole west coast of the continent all the way down to Patagonia. Eventually, um, that's so great. That's it was amazing. awesome. Yeah, it was an incredible trip, and and what a like awesome way to kick off trying to figure out if you're compatible with someone, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you, uh, you know, if you want to find out if you can truly get along with your partner, travel with them, uh, and travel Super in a swim. non-luxurious manner, like out of a backpack, because hmm. all of the, uh, stressful moments and craziness that comes out of that, like if you can manage uh, your relationship through that, I think it's a good sign. So I, I, a hundred percent under like when we travel with all four kids like oh my that, gosh that is the most stress i've ever been a part of yeah it, and it's a mate like i i a hundred percent know i married married a soulmate because of it because we we're not like you see those clips all the time of like we just got the whole family in the car and now we want to get a divorce like you see them on instagram reels all the time and we're like i understand where they're coming from there like that's not the the final result we get to but like 
yeah mm -hmm. traveling with anybody is just traveling's fun because yep. of that it's yeah. just problem solving it's, you're all yeah, you're doing pretty is much problem solving. that show yeah. the amazing race is uh kind of is telling of what everybody experiences when traveling just blown out to the thousandth degree you know <laughs> yeah when yeah i mean just there there's nothing more stressful than not being in your your own home or wherever you call home Comfort and having zone. to deal with challenges and you know get through it uh and at, you know do that in a country where the language that's spoken primarily is not the language you speak you know throw in a couple other factors and it's like <laughs> mm -hmm. it gets exciting really quick so all right I didn't see so Ecuador was... coming up that's awesome <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> So that was 2015. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I think that was 2015. So between there and now, mm -hmm. you went from basically full-time travel to kind of having home base to re-immersing yourself into full-time travel, right? Yep. You're, yep. you're back on the road full-time? Yep. So, yeah. How did so, that come to be? Well, um, so when we got back from that, south america trip you know we just had like the time of our lives we saw all this amazing stuff that we'd wanted to see we had all these great experiences and then it was like oh it's time to re-enter normal life and <laughs> we were kind of like oh this is really hard and um at the time i was living in la and my partner amanda was in san francisco and we were kind of like well we get along pretty well we didn't kill each other after three and a half months so we should probably like actually live together uh, <laughs> And there's some debate as to like, should I move up to San Francisco or should she come down to LA? Uh, and in the end, I ended up moving up there. Um, and that, that lasted for about eight months. And the two of us were like kind of trying to piece together freelance part-time work. Um, but, you know, San Francisco costs a fortune. And really, if you don't have like a legit job there, um, it's just, it's really stressful. It's like, you don't feel like you're thriving. You feel like you're just getting by. So that was what inspired us to get on the road full-time in the first place. You know, we're like, oh, if we bought an RV or, you know, a camper van or something, like e even if we end up selling it in two years, like we won't be any further behind the ball than we would have been if we paid rent for two years in San Francisco. Um, and we even like, we got a, a cheap RV. We spent yeah. like seven and a half thousand bucks on our RV. You know, we didn't get like a sprinter that was all decked out. Like some people do. So yeah, you, didn't spend, you didn't spend 70. You spent yeah, right. se exactly. And so, so tell the audience exactly what it was because yeah, pictures so, yeah. tell the story, if, but for anyone that's just listening. So we like, we, we were looking at cargo vans. We were like, what, you know, a sprinter was the obvious choice just because it's like so many people do them. There's floor plans. It's a, kind of a known Parts thing, of yeah. but we were like, well, why would we want to do something typical? Let's do something that's going to be hard and throw more adversity this. at this. So we got a 1964 camper van uh, or RV, I guess, specifically. Um, and mm -hmm. it's the one that we got is called a Clark Cortez. Um, so it's made by the Clark forklift company and they, the Clark forklift company made like, I think like 37 or 3,800 of those ever um, from 63 to sometime in the seventies, they discontinued them because they couldn't really compete with like Winnebago. And, well, yeah. um, so did you decide to look for one of those specifically and then hunt it down or just happened upon it? Oh, yeah, you no, did. We, oh. we did. Yeah. Well, it, you know, we kind of just happened upon it. Like uh, Amanda found, there's this guy named Stefan Shea who, was a like a marathon runner and outside magazine outside magazine did a piece on him um about like marathon runner is living in you know classic rv um his was like this mint green like kind of beachy one and he was <laughs> living in southern that. california <laughs> and um yeah so we saw that we came across that or she came across that and she was like hey check this out this looks pretty cool and i saw it and i mean like you saw from the photos, it's just like oozes character. Uh, so yeah. I, I don't know. I saw it and I was just like, wow, that's going to not only be a lot cheaper than a sprinter, but like no one else is going to have that except Stefan Shea. You steal the uh, show everywhere you go with that. Thing. Totally. And we ended up finding him. He has his own restoration company called Epoch Restorations. And so we like called him and uh, 
he was a super nice down earth guy. And we were like, Hey, we're thinking about buying the same vehicle that you have. Like, what can you tell us about it? You know? And he kind of filled us in on the ins and outs of owning a Cortez and what, what that looks like. Um, and then, so cool. yeah. So as you can see from this photo, so that's not the original interior. We, no, um, <laughs> no. Yeah. no, that's not a 60 year old interior. Yeah, no, we, we, didn't initially i i mean when we thought about getting a sprinter we're like prepared to do some sort of build right um but the beauty of the cortez was we found one in washington that like visually it looked really good um the interior was all original and we're like oh cool like this is livable right now we don't even have to do any work which is you know so many people like want to get a van and get on the road but like either they're building it out as they're living in it which is like seems like a nightmare to me i haven't done that but um well, actually, I mean, we sort of did that with this. We didn't, it wasn't built out when we moved out, but we had, we did have a place to park it. Like we weren't like living in it, living in it. We were like living on our friend's property in it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so but, you had a home base there. Yeah. 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 We had a home base, which made working on it easy. But so we were just like baseline. We're like, we're going to replace the headliner. We're going to put some tongue and groove wood in the headliner. It'll give our, our own little kind of like touch. It'll feel really unique to us. And I remember the day I started pulling the headliner down and like mouth shit was just oh, raining. Oh, you kicked and the snowball off the top it of It was just, yeah, it was terrible. Oh. And and I pulled the headliner down and it's oh. like, it's like all of the insulation was like chewed, you know, like tunnels through it. I can smell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very distinct. Oh, it's so we're like, clearly this needs some some TLC. And, and it was like literally behind every wall all the insulation was chewed up. It was like full of like acorns that squirrels had stashed like over the mm -hmm. years and stuff. Despite the fact that the, the previous owner had stored it in like a, a garage, you know, like an airplane hangar style garage, mm -hmm. but it just, you know, oh, it's that not... won't stop. <laughs> so, no. Yeah, no, no it rodents are getting in if it's stationary, mm -hmm. that's just going to happen. Uh, so we ended up doing that, that like a full renovation of the inside. Like we ripped everything out down to the sheet metal. We treated everything with like rust sealer. We re-insulated. We, you know, we, we changed the layout slightly to try and make it a little bit more comfortable for us for, for traveling. Cause it, you know, like I, one thing I've found with even like the best designed RVs, they're not really designed to be lived in. So mm. I feel like for anyone who's traveled it, like extensively, you always think of ways you would improve it. And so we had this opportunity to do that. So we, we did, we kind of like, it had an enclosed bathroom. We kind of like knocked the wall down to, you know, um, recapture some of that interior space and then like put up a shower curtain, um, just it's to like home renovations. It. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Home renovations. Uh, so. It came together really nice. So from there, how did that devolve into the Ram and Airstream? Yeah. So we lived evolve, in the, no, I guess evolve. It would be evolve. We'll get, we'll give you the, yeah. I mean, let's that. call it just like a, a lateral transition, right? <laughs> like it was something different. Um, so we were in the Cortez for close to three years and we well, kind sure. of, yeah, it was, it was a long time. Um, like I haven't lived in the same place in three years in 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I've always moved around a lot. I, like part of me kind of thrives on that, but part of me gets tired of it too. Like I'm always like, am I, when am I going to stop moving? You know? <laughs> um, but so we were in the Cortez for like three years and um, it was awesome. And we saw all this cool stuff, but it kind of ran its course. We, we started to like want something a little different. We wanted some change and we ended up um, Amanda's sister uh, bought a place in Denver a few years back and she was looking for a roommate and we were kind of looking for a break from traveling full time. So we ended up renting a room from her in Denver, like downtown Denver and downtown Denver rules. Yeah, it was fun. I like, I like Denver. I mean, as far as cities go, I think it's really awesome. And there's, there are a lot of cool people there just because you know, so many people move to Colorado to do mm -hmm. fun stuff outdoors. So that's like exactly kind of scene, so. everything's right there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're close, you know, it's like on a clear day, you, you see the mountains and they're not that far. Yep. So we were there for about a year and a half. And <laughs> during this time, like COVID happened and, you know, <laughs> all sorts of exciting stuff, but, um, we were there for a while and we did, we started to kind of get that feeling of like, we want to be 
traveling again. We want to be like a little bit, you know, it's like after living in a vehicle and, and spending weeks at a time in Joshua tree climbing or, you know, any of the places that we go while we were living in the camper van, it's like being in a city is such a different experience that yeah. that kind of, that got old. We were like, it's time to do something different. Um, so we actually sold the Cortez because it, it was just, it was too difficult to try and come up with a plan to keep it, not being homeowners. It's like, where are we going to mm. put it? You know, we're going to yeah. pay to put it in storage. It's just going to sit around. Like that's a vehicle that, that kind of needs to be driven and needs to be, you know, maintained had you, with the rodents last time it sat. So had you found limitations in your desire for exploration in its off-road capabilities? I mean, Definitely. <laughs> you know, it, it certainly had its limitations. It, it was really cool in a lot of ways. It was front wheel drive, which for a vehicle from that year, that was pretty unusual. That was pretty, uh, yeah. It was, a, progressive. it was a four speed manual. It was geared really low. So, oh my God, it, really? It was a four speed yeah. manual? Yeah. So it did really well, like in, you know, situations on dirt. Like we even had it in snow a few times. Not that I ever wanted to do that, but never do that um, again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we took it down some, some dirt roads that seriously abused it. Well, actually funny story. So, but we broke down in that thing quite a few times as you might imagine, <laughs> um, but one of the best <sighs> breakdowns was on the West side of Yosemite national park. And we ended up getting a tow, like an over 200 mile tow all the way to Bishop, uh, on a medium duty flatbed oh, yeah. tow truck, which the one thing I can suggest for anyone that's going to live full-time in a vehicle, pay for the extended roadside coverage through your insurance <laughs> policy. Don't get your Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> because during the three years that we were in the Cortez, we had, I think like six or seven toes. And I think three or four of them would have been over a thousand dollars if we didn't have that. And we paid zero dollars out of pocket for I, any of those toes. It was the, yeah, the addition on your insurance for the year is like a hundred bucks. Yeah. It's like nothing. Something nominal. It, it is like, don't even think twice about it. Just do it. What did the tow truck drivers say when they showed up to, to help you out? And load the oh thing God. Up? I mean, they, you know, they were always kind of surprised and, but the cool thing was like after enough toes, I, I it was, it was new to them, but I'd be like, just hook up here and here. And like, we've, we've done this a few times. So right. <laughs> so good. But so we, we got towed, we got towed all the way through the park to Bishop, um, because I oh, found a shop that reluctantly Jesus. agreed to take our vehicle and work on it. That was the other thing. Having that vehicle was, it was really challenging to find people that would want to work on it, even Who though works? it was, uh, what's that? Who works on something like that? I mean, so whoever you even convinced you. <laughs> But, but the cool thing is it's like, mechanically it's, it's simple, you know, it's a 64, it had a Chrysler slant six, uh, engine in it, which is like, they made millions of those and they put them in a lot of different vehicles. Like they were in the Dodge dart, they were in the Plymouth Valiant. Um, they even used them for like farm equipment. So like finding parts for the engine, super easy, um, pretty straightforward to work on. Uh, but yeah, just a lot of people you're like, yeah, I have a Clark Cortez and they're like, nope. I've never heard of it. That's it. And you're like, it's, it's, it, there's nothing to it. Like there's no computers. It's really easy. But um, um, slant six was in production until 2000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like a super reliable bulletproof engine that, that just kicked ass. And I don't know, but um, so we had to have our clutch rebuilt. That's what happened with that toe. And they had to pull the entire front end, which on this vehicle was on a sled. So it was transaxle engine all on one metal tube frame that just required six frame bolts removed to pull out and obviously disconnect everything. Six. But yeah, it was a big process. But when they took it out, it was like, oh, the upper passenger shock mount is completely broken away from the frame. Who knows how long that's been like that for? And you know, there was like just a ton of stuff that needed to be addressed. Like there were some welds on the frame. There was that there, were like we had to replace the shocks. We had to get a new distributor, like just a ton Christ. of stuff. So we, we addressed all of that in this one breakdown, mm. which we ended up spending a month in Bishop getting everything fixed. Wait, did they let you sleep in the camper still? Or did you have to well, go somewhere else? <laughs> I, think, uh, I think they would have. That was like one of uh. the best mechanic experiences I've had. Those guys were so Bishop Automotive, Nate, the owner or the guy who was managing it. Super nice guy. Like every day they'd like, 
face to face with me. Well, I drank a coffee. They'd tell me what was going on, like what they were waiting on. Just super nice guys. So I have no doubt they would have let us sleep in it. But um, we had, we were like, we had a, uh, we had a Prius at the time that was stored at our friend's house in Lone Pine, which was like a couple hundred miles south. So we picked that up. We actually went to Walmart and got like an eight person like mega tent and we set it up nice. on BLM land. And we we're like, we're not going <laughs> to like we refuse to pay for an Airbnb or a hotel. Mm. So we set up this like little shanty town for ourselves with like our solar panels. We pulled those down and like had a battery. So we had like our full work set up and everything. Oh, that's so uh, funny. In Wait, the volcanic tablelands. You towed here from Yellowstone? From Yosemite. Yosemite. Okay. If Ooh. I said Yellowstone... I, I might have said Yellowstone. That would have been. Shocking. Yes. I'm Google <laughs> mapping things, trying to figure things out. No, You're like, that's more, more than a $1,400 tow. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yep. So, so you were in California for this. That makes sense why yes. I couldn't find Bishop Wyoming. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this was all, yep. Yeah, the 395 corridor, like oh, between sweet. Mammoth and. Uh, that's Mammoth and even so. But this is a very is roundabout no way job. of answering your question. Uh, <laughs> you, you had asked about, like, how do we get into the Airstream? And so a big part of it was off-road capability, you know, like we didn't really think about that going into it and just how much we were going to want to be able to go to a lot of these like off the beaten path places to camp mm -hmm. for free or, you know, go explore. And yeah, we got to talking during the time we had the Cortez. We were like, our next vehicle is going to be more capable. It's, it's likely going to be a truck. And um, yeah, we sold the Cortez and we are what a couple of our friends had airstreams that they were living out of. And I had never been in one until this past year. And I like got to visit them and I was like, Oh, I could do this. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is going to be a lot more comfortable. Um, you know, much different experience. And it, and it's cool because like, now that we have the airstream, we pull it where we need to go with the truck, we set it up. And then once you're separated, you take the truck wherever you want to go you know, with very, very few limitations. Right, right. And you also don't have to pack up and put your shit away every day in the Airstream like you did in the van. You know, like if you have a camper van, anytime you want to drive somewhere, if you don't spend 30 minutes, like putting your things away, it all falls out of the cabinets and it all ends up on the floor. And it's everywhere. Like you know, it's like with the Airstream, we can go and drive and do errands on a daily basis and we don't have to pack stuff up, mm -hmm. um, which is Makes really, sense. really nice. Yeah. It's like a, uh, it's like a small luxury compared to yeah. like, Oh, we're going to the supermarket. We have to drive five miles on dirt to get there. Yeah. I mean, it, it honestly, the Airstream truck combo feels very luxurious compared to the 64 RV. It the 64. What year is the Airstream? The Airstream's at 2012. Oh, so you, yeah, you're all in on the few on like, I mean, the Airstream shit when the, when the RV came out, the Airstream was kind of like what everybody envisioned 2020 to look like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the future. Oh, what was that GM Motorama stuff? That's what the Airstream looks like it came out of, you know? <laughs> but, they yeah, still look no. like it. <laughs> they do. They're yeah, fucking it's, cool, man. They're so funny. They're so timeless, you know? Like, you look at that, and if I didn't tell you it's a 2012, like, it could be, like, a 70s model. It could be, a, you know, you never know. Yeah, it until, could be a until you get like thousand dollar one that was built last year. I'm assuming until you get like right up on it, and I'm there's got to be like little things that you could tell. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there there are. I I'm a a, a new enough owner. I couldn't like explain them or list them to you right now. But right. you know, once you've once you've lived it, yeah, you know, kind of like the things that you're looking for that that make a classic ones stand out versus the more, the more contemporary ones dude when it's, i when i first started working at the the classic pickup trucks parts company there'd be dudes that are like that's not a 71 that's a 72 you have the wrong <laughs> side markers and i'm like well the yeah. owner put the wrong side markers on it that's not my fault he said to me <laughs> just now the, the crazy thing about airstream though is that it's it's it might be the only globally identifiable trailer other than like you know the jeep like what are the m1002 or whatever those pull along things are from the military and anybody can pick out an airstream and, and they're just like iconically cool yeah so they're they're very recognizable there are there are like a couple other space cans as people call them sometimes space trailers cans. right like uh <laughs> this the spartan is one you know that like to the untrained eye you might see one and you're like oh it's an airstream um, and I only know this because I have some friends who they run an ultralight 
backpacking gear shop out of Spartan a bunch of vintage trailers that they bought and converted into mobile stores. And so they have a Spartan, they have a Vagabond, they have a couple Airstreams. Um, so okay, the Spartan looks like it came out of Fallout. Let the record show. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a guy in LA who runs a Spartan as like a mobile barber shop. Uh-huh. Um, he has a, he has his own barber shop, but like they tour with that every now and then. And I yeah. the other reason I know that is he's got like a 1950s chevy or ford i can't remember it looks like a fucking science project <laughs> not that it's not cool it's just look, it looks like more back to the future too than back to the future I, yeah, yeah i feel like the spartans like leaning into the wind where the airstreams are all like no, no we'll just let it go over us and- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's it's extremely polished too maybe that's just that one uh, that too that there, are, there are a lot that were really there there's some they're that's got really chrome <laughs> yeah they're chrome and this one's minty it's got a mint that's that was the saving grace uh, i we even got complimented on the chrome on the ram matching the airstream and we were like oh, <laughs> i guess it does <laughs> well i guess i gotta paint everything black now <laughs> gotta get the blackout kit for the airstream yeah. oh no is that like uh, the guys that paint the loreans they're like i dented one panel and i can't get that one panel so i just painted the whole car oh boy but you you ru- ruined it <laughs> The vagabonds are weird. Yeah, they're a little different. And I never saw the interior of theirs when it was original. So I'm, I'm not sure as far as like the layout, what that looked like compared to some of the Airstream layouts. But Oh, man, finding a high-res image is not working <laughs> <Good> well. <laughs> uh, so, Matt, so what else are you getting off to? You're, uh, you're doing some adventures with said Airstream and truck. Yeah. Where yeah, you, kind uh, of our main... Repointing it. Yeah, our main... Uh, our main, well, so we have the Airstream down here in Prescott and we're at HQ and we're kind of bouncing around from, from central Arizona to other destinations for paragliding. Um, so that's something that kind of came up for us in the last year. That was like our, our COVID hobby that we developed. Like it was an out, an outdoor pursuit. <laughs> so Definitely the first person to say that on this show, what's that <laughs> paragliding? Oh our, yeah. Our COVID hobby was paragliding. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, I, I realize it's a pretty like obscure pursuit uh, and, and kind of odd, but so we, back when we were in the Cortez, we ran this, this camper van meetup two years in a row in Idaho uh, on the, on the West side of the Tetons. And we had these two paragliding instructors come one year and they were like, oh, we'll give you, you know, we'll give you a deal on a tandem paragliding flight at Jackson hole. Um, Cause we, we had such a fun time and we kind of talked with them and they, they told us the, the price and we we're like, well, we kind of can't say no to that. Cause it's like, it's like normally like 450 bucks to do a flight off of the resort there with a, a tandem pilot. And they were like, it'll be like a hundred bucks a person. And we we're oh, like, yeah, yeah, we're like, okay, yeah, like, done. sure. Sign sounds me cool. up. Let's do it. Um, and so we went and we did this flight and the second I landed, I was like, well, I need to learn how to do that myself. Like I want to be a pilot, <laughs> um, you know? So that was a few years ago, that was 2018. And, you know, it's kind of, it's not like the most accessible sport. Let's say that like it's, it's, it costs some money and, you know, like you want to get trained properly. It's not a kind of thing you like, you could just buy the gear and go try and figure it out. But I think it's a lot smarter to, to take lessons. So, um, when we were living in Denver, we found a school in Boulder that seemed like it might be a good fit for us. And so we went and learned and that kind of took over our lives really quickly. Um, so now that's like pretty much our main pursuit. Like when we have spare time, we're usually trying to figure out where we're going to go fly and where the, the weather is going to be good for flying. And, um, it works really well with the Airstream because we can go and post up at these spots that are great for flying for like a week, a two week, three week session. And, you know, work remotely and fly in the mornings and the evening or, you know, on any gate on any given day when there's a uh, good weather. So what is, uh, what's core territory for this? This is something I know like literally nothing about other than that. I see people doing it once in a while, yeah. like in the valleys, you know, in like Northern New York or Massachusetts. Yeah. Where, uh, where, where's like the main place for this? Well, um, I mean, it's all over and 
I don't really know many of the East coast spots just because like I've, I've only learned how to do it in the last, it's been like a year, a little over a year. So most of my flying has been in like Colorado and the mountain West. Um, but you know, usually like mountain sites, you need, you need terrain to fly off of, um, like a lot of people, when you tell them you're going paragliding, they're like, Oh, so you like, you like jump off of, you're going to go jump off the mountain. And it's like, well, <laughs> So it's, I would describe it as running off a gradual hill or <laughs> jumping off a mountain. It's pedantics. Um, it's yeah. <laughs> right. So, so you need, that's actually, that's our, that was our first flight, uh, Dude, off of the top of the Jackson Ski awesome. resort, the, the photo there, but so you need, you need a, you need a mountain and you need a place where you can land safely. So clearing, mm-hmm. you know, without trees. So, um, really there are spots everywhere. Um, in Colorado, we, we've done probably the most flying in Boulder just because that's where we learned. And that was one of the closest sites to us. Um, but uh, Oregon's got some excellent flying sites. Washington has some really great flying sites. Uh, Arizona has great sites. Like the premier paragliding spot in Arizona is uh, less than an hour and a half from where, we're, where we are here in Prescott. Although it's kind of winding down for the season because it's a really high site for the area. And so Mm-hmm. Um, the road gets closed and you can't really get into it. Um, ah, yeah, but interesting. Uh, yeah. So I, I'd say probably my favorite place that we've flown so far is in Oregon near Medford at this mountain called Woodrat, just because, uh, as far as like the quality of the flying, we had the most consistent weather. I mean, we'd go and every day that we'd go up and fly, we'd get at least an hour long flight, if not, you know, two or three hours of flying. So oh, shit. how long are you in the air? I mean, we're newer pilots, so we're not the best yet. And we're still like refining our technique. Um, but I mean, like the top pilots are flying like 10 hour flights. What? <laughs> well, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. What? You said yeah. 10 hours? Yeah. Eight, nine, 10 hours. Like you can stay up indefinitely as long as the sun is out and you've got, you've got the right conditions. Um, because I mean, this, the surface area of the wing is big enough that you find you find rising air and you just stay in it and you can stay up as long as you can find rising air to stay in. So, so is this the kind of thing like as you're flying, you you say so you catch an updraft and you just feel yourself start to ascend? Yeah. Yeah. And you have like we fly with these little flight instruments called variometers, which is is basically it's like a, uh, it's a tiny it's, barometer. <laughs> Yeah. 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 It's based on barometric pressure. And, yeah. and as you go up, it's, it's a super sensitive one. So as you go up, you get like a, a you know, an aud- audible tone, like a beep, 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 beep. And that usually increases with the speed that you're going up at. And um, so that's, that's helpful. But if you get in a really strong thermal, like there's no question that you're going up, you feel like you're getting like jerked up into the sky. I mean, it feels like an elevator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, you can hours though. Yeah. Holy shit. I mean, those are, you know, the, you're talking about like some of the top pilots, like th- those are, that's like world record territory. I think, I think just this, this past year is either this past year or this year, someone set the distance record in Texas. They flew like over 300 miles and it was like a 10 hour <laughs> flight. Yeah. I can't imagine three hours in the air so, like that. That's yeah. fucking crazy. I know. I mean, Hey, like, an hour feels very mentally taxing. Um, yeah. like it's a lot. That's, a, how that's do, yeah. how do you if you'd have told me it was an hour, I'd have been like, that sounds like a solid amount of time. Right. Even if it, it was does. like 30 minutes, I'd be like, all right, reward plus what you've put into it. That sounds, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah I think usually about, like, like, I mean, we're, we're still at that point where like 30 minutes is like, that's great. You know, an hour is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anytime you get an hour flight, you're, you're pretty psyched. I mean, that's like, a long it feels like a long time so because the, the 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 last two pictures of a head up i put in God, wood rat yeah. paragliding uh-huh they look like you're thousands of feet in the air you can be i mean it depends on where you go so when we were at wood rat um like i had two climbs that brought me to like over nine thousand feet and the launch was at three thousand something so i was like <laughs> close to a mile above the ground oh my god <laughs> You, no oxygen you're oxygen's just... ten thousand feet normally so yeah i mean there there we didn't fly with oxygen because that is so rare to get that high there but okay. like when we fly in colorado i mean some of the sites we've flown at colorado like when i've flown loveland pass you are launching at thirteen thousand feet like that's oh, where you're shit. starting you can um, wheel loveland yeah 
go up there on in four by four. Yeah. So literally you can drive to the top of Loveland Pass Park and then you hike up the shoulder of Mount Snicktow, which is a 13,000 foot peak and you can fly off of that. Um, the I, you know, now I'm like, I don't remember the, I, I've been over 14,000. Like when we, we were just out in Utah for close to a month flying and um, at this site called Monroe, which is actually, so Monroe is like one of the best spots to fly in Utah, especially for trying to go long distance. And they have the highest regulated Ushba, which is like the national organization that regulates paragliding. So it's the highest site that's covered by their insurance. And so the launch is like 11,200. So you, you have a very good possibility of flying high there. So when we fly that site, we've carried oxygen with us because yeah, if you're spending over an hour above 14,000 feet, you feel it. And people there regularly get to 18,000 feet. Like when God, people fly there, damn. <laughs> they can, they can get that, that high. So, so, yep. all right. So now like the Dude, FFA and you start to kick in. like when you're at those altitudes, like uh-huh. civilian aircraft can be there too. Like, are, is it just, you yeah, seriously. Quibble? Like, so, so according to the FAA, we are not allowed to fly above 17,999 feet. That's our ceiling, yeah. like, no matter where we are in North America with maybe a couple exceptions for like specific areas um, based on aircraft flight patterns, but technically you're not supposed to go above that height. Okay. Um, people do. Oh, right. Yeah. God. Like, yeah. Like it happens. Um, but yeah. Right. Yeah. No, so I, I fly a, I've flown a drone. So I, so I did all the FAA tests. So uh-huh, I was like, uh-huh. wait a minute, these things are way higher than. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's a crazy freaking sport and it is so much fun. I, like I, I have done a lot of like obscure sports, like ice climbing, rock climbing, you know, mountaineering, long, mm-hmm. long biking, like I, not, th- nothing has compared to this, like the kind of the freedom and the, the space that you have to develop your skills, you know, like the idea that I could go and fly a hundred miles with like basically some like nylon and strings. Yeah, right. Crazy. It's yeah. It, it kind of bends the frame of reference for what's yeah. capable or doable. How totally. I mean, how, I mean, it's like, a, like most people have had a dream of flying. Like yeah. you can literally get a paraglider and go fly. Like you can literally take a thing that fits into yeah. a can go and fly off of a mountain with it. Oh, now I'm going to have to look into this. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would say like, I would tell anyone who likes exciting things, like go take a tandem flight because you know, that way you've got someone who's totally qualified, who knows what they're doing in control and you can just enjoy the flight and see what it's like. And how cold is it? Good, you're going to want to do it. <laughs> how, how cold does it get? What if you don't like being cold? It can get cold. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. you know, if it's like, 50 degrees on launch and you get 5,000 feet above the ground, like generally the atmosphere cools down at like five degrees per thousand feet. So, you know, Mm. you go 5,000 feet, it it could be 25 degrees colder or more. So so, I've had times where I've had to land because I've gotten so cold. uh, Like I had to intentionally say, I have to stop flying. I need to go land because (laughs) they're numb. My fingers Um, won't do the the gas anymore. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't happen very often. That's like, kind of, that, that was like flying in, I want to say like March in Colorado, like there was snow on the ground when we were getting into the air. So mm-hmm. well, that'll do it. Yeah. yeah. March in Colorado is a little, usually chilly. Yeah, it can be. Well, I was not expecting to go there tonight. I got to say that's uh that's some uncharted territory for us. But that that's really, that's, that's fucking crazy and i mean you guys have the perfect setup to hub out and kind of live this the only like, the only hobby. thing yeah the only thing we need that we don't have right now is is a canopy for the bed of the truck because the one downside of an airstream is it's super comfortable to live in but it actually doesn't have that much storage space like okay. you know it's a, it's another vehicle that like it's made mm-hmm. for recreation. It's made for people that go out on weekends and stay at RV parks, not people who want to haul a ton of bulky gear around and live in right, their vehicle. Right. So that so, like the, the question I always come back to is like when you're on BML land, like are you running a generator? Like how? Yeah. What's your setup for power? 
Yeah, we have we have solar panels. We have 300 yeah. watts of solar on the roof, and then some house batteries, um, and then an AC inverter. So, mm-hmm. you know, we don't have enough power to like run air conditioning or anything like that. Like we'd have to get a generator, but we're we're generally trying to avoid weather where it's hot enough where we have to run an AC. Um, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's just like that's, that's tricky. We just try and avoid it. Or if we know we're gonna have to do AC, like when we were in Monroe in Utah, it was. Um, over a month ago, you know, it was still hot there, but we just, we kind of chalked it up and just paid for an RV site at a, like a campground. So we, okay. cause we have a dog too. And we're like, yeah. we have to have air conditioning so that he doesn't die while we're up flying. So, right. Yeah. So I did quick Google search. Yeah. Uh, so from 2009 to 2014, eight parasailers died. Eight. Yeah. Parasailers or paragliders? Parasailers. Okay. That is that, a different sport. That's different. <laughs> It might be a higher number for paragliding. <laughs> I, I hate to say it, but <laughs> see, that's just still the, when I try to get that and skydiving comes up. Interesting. So see, when I look at that, I'm like, oh, eight. That's how many people die on quads usually, like in a three month span in the North Country. And and is you know? now is was that in in North America? I think so. It's like there are not very many people who paraglide in North America. So that's actually a very significant number. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's the thing. It's like, what percentage is that? Not, so, yeah, not, not number. And, not and here's where the fatality rates get terribly skewed. So in skydiving, there are 13 or sorry, 3 million skydiving jumps per year. Okay. And there are 13 fatalities. Okay. And, but in paragliding, there are 18 fatalities. So five more. Uh-huh. So that's only recorded in 242,000 flights. Yeah, that's a much worse statistic. So, so the the percentage rate goes up. It is paragliding is is definitely more dangerous than skydiving, which might feel counterintuitive. And I honestly, when we got into it, I remember being like, "Well, at least it's not as dangerous as skydiving." No, no, it's much more dangerous because you have all these opportunities to make dumb decisions that like snowball into a very <laughs> bad end result. You yeah. know, like skydiving is pretty straightforward yeah. from what I understand. You jump out of the plane, you pull your parachute at a certain point or somebody it does it for you and you're, and you land or it doesn't open and you cut away and you open your reserve. Paragliding's yeah. like, Oh, I'm going to fly over here. Oh, I'm going to keep going. Oh shit. Now I have nowhere that I can glide to. That's not a tree or rocks you know so i'm going to land on rocks or in a tree so paragliding it it involves many more decision making points and yeah yeah i mean it's kind of crazy it is it's like sobering to think about it like in the last year since we started paragliding just out of the people that we've met who paraglide in the last year i think i know like four or five people who have broken their vertebra and their back like in oh, the last shit. year alone because um, that's what it, it doesn't look like you land feet first it looks like you land butt first yeah you land you oh. land on like your ass or your back generally yeah. speaking um so that's pretty common um probably one of the most common injuries in the sport which is you know <laughs> that's very kind of real. important yeah it is yeah <laughs> it's not it's, it's not a sport to get into if you're like a cavalier like rash decision maker you know i mean like you have to think about it like <laughs> flying a plane right well, like it's a hundred percent of FAA consequence you to things be are the most boring uh, person uh, ever <laughs> yeah yeah i mean like people that take big risks sometimes have it pay off well you know like if you take a big risk you could have a big reward but also the kind of risk that you're taking with the sport is that you might smash yourself into the ground and that is not right. very forgiving right. so. it's, it's a force multiplier of suck yeah <laughs> like the, so the, on that. The, yeah. the website that i'm on for like i was just looking at safety stuff like they had a, a, a picture of a guy who's above a lake and above hills and above trees i don't know where he's gonna land mm-hmm. lake yeah but like, i mean if this water gonna hurts sink. crash in the you water have to if you have hurts. to choose you know it depends right like if you're landing in water you don't really want to land in water like if you can avoid it um unless you have a boat but <laughs> you're tied up with threads. you've got all these lines you yeah. can get tangled in you know like you've got to get out of the gear um honestly they they recommend like if given the choice between multiple shitty things to to hit or land landing in a tree is actually not that bad of a choice um 
the because usually your wing problem. gets infinite <laughs> and it keeps yeah. you from hitting the ground. Um, and also like if you kind of aim for the canopy of the tree where like all the branches and leaves and stuff are, it's like kind of a soft landing, sort kinda of. Kind of cushy. It's like, yeah. it's like when they crash into cardboard boxes, like but yeah. they're full of sticks. Yeah. I remember, I remember doing one of the tests where, you know, that's a question. It's like given X, Y, Z place to land because you have to make an emergency landing. What is the correct choice? And the correct choice mm. was in the tree. And like, everyone got it wrong because we were, right. you know, we're so new and it's like, you, you don't want to land in a tree, but. So polo grounds seems perfect. Ooh, Just yeah. manicured lawn. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Grassy field. There's nothing better than a grassy field. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wait! You can like that's slide all in. I have around me. Field. What's that? That's all I have around me. <laughs> you also have not many mountains to jump. Sounds up. like yeah, yeah. Well, you can tow. People do towing in places that are flat, so they have these hydraulic winches where you hook up to like a five thousand foot long mm -hmm. cable, and they pull you up into the air. Because when the wing's moving forwards, it creates it's lift. lift. Yeah, you just you that's what they do for the gliders mm -hmm. near us. They have like they're not planes there's no motor it's just a, yeah. a glider and they just the guy who owns the facility has like a 2003 chevy avalanche and it just hooks them up to a cable and toes them yeah they just yeah. they're in the air for hours yeah crazy same thing except the wings above them instead of you're sitting on it yeah mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah and probably a, a pretty substantial price factor yeah i don't if even you, know what, what those sailplanes cost i mean that's that's a big investment, I think, I think. Most people do it. Also, have a hangar on the premises, and yeah. suddenly you're in it for you know uh, a pretty healthy mortgage payment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a casual hundred grand on a hobby. Yeah, yeah. Which <laughs> here I am shit. fretting about five hundred bucks earlier for a bumper cover. <laughs> oh my god! I saw somebody listed a build for sale. I think it was a forerunner, and I think it was like a twenty, like seventeen or eighteen forerunner for sale, and I. For the life of me, I can't remember if it was on Expo or if it was on like the Forerunner forum or something, but it was like a Forerunner with suspension and armor and a rooftop tent. And the asking price was $100,000. Like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> you are on drugs. It's got a Toyota badge on it, though, you know? Yeah, well, that's only good for 20%, though. Even at 80, that's a stretch, you know? <laughs> asking prices are asking prices. They're not. Ain't that the truth? So sailplanes are 50 to 300 K. Okay. <laughs> so you could buy a desert racer. Yeah. You could buy a Bronco. Yeah. Look yeah. at us coming full circle. We've gotten good at this over, <laughs> over almost a hundred episodes. Tying it all together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it only took, you know, almost well, sweet months. <laughs> Matt, what do you want to plug, man? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> what do I want to plug? I don't know. Um, <laughs> You did a great you know, think, case for paragliding. So yeah, yeah right. Definitely. We've, we have exhausted that well of uh, excitement. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, uh, like if you're an expo reader and you haven't checked out the Overland Journal podcast, I think that's worth a listen. We, uh, mm -hmm. Scott, you know, who's our founder, he, he has some pretty incredible connections in the industry to like the OGs of overlanding. Um, and he, he interviews a lot of these people and um, Ashley, Giordano, um, yep. from Dust yeah, Glory, you know, her and Richard, times. um, Ashley's starting to host some podcast episodes and, um, I've been on a couple, but there's just some really, really incredible information in some of those episodes with, with some of these folks. Um, so yeah, it's, it's worth giving a listen, not to <laughs> plug a podcast on your podcast, but <laughs> absolutely no, that's you should. What, that's yeah. what you're here for, dude. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's worth it's worth giving a listen. And you know, if if you've never seen the magazine too, like try and try and get a hold of a copy because it is just it's so beautiful. You know, the quality of the printing and the standards yeah. for the photography and the stories that are in the magazine are just um they're really top notch. We've got I will uh, say, yeah, um, as somebody who subscribes to like three magazines and who tries to exclusively read print books like have physical copies of books getting overland journal is like an event like the quality like you were saying of the print of the pictures you know the stories that are there you know inside the actual pages themselves it, it's like it's it's special it, it makes you feel like a part of something and not just like staring at you know 
people doing fucking sports it's, or something that are unattainable. Dude, it's two runs at Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a cheap magazine, but I think it's, uh, it, it's also not a lot of money for what it is, you know, like yeah. it's the kind of thing that can live on your coffee table and you can have a collection of them on your bookshelf. Yep. And like, it's kind of timeless. I mean, like I find myself next door in our warehouse looking at issues from 10 years ago and like <laughs> they're just as satisfying to look at as the issues that came out, you know, last quarter. Um, so yeah, it's just cool. You know, if you ever get the chance worth checking out for sure. Yeah. It, it's every time I read it, it reminds me of the reason that I fell in love with top gear in like 2006 or seven. It's, it's because like, the story, you know, the vehicles, the background, the story and the exposure to the world and the things you would otherwise never have any exposure to are, are the reason to come and to stay. All the Christmas and, episodes. All, yeah, pretty much all the specials. <laughs> but, you know, reading Overland Journal is kind of like top gear specials for off-road people. You know, you get a little bit of culture and a little bit of society and a little bit of fucking cars shitting themselves. So... Hopefully it's, hopefully it's the kind of thing that like can inspire people to, to go out and travel, you know, a little bit more widely. Right. I mean, and that is also to say like, there's so much cool shit in this country. You don't have to feel like you like going to Africa doesn't qualify you as an overlander, right? Like you can have an overland adventure right here in this country and it can be just as spectacular, but sure. also you'll, you look at an issue of our magazine and like, you'll want to go and, you know, update your passport and start planning like a trip to mm -hmm. somewhere exotic. Cause that's where, <laughs> that's where a lot of the content it's is the from. truth. Yeah. yeah. It's the truth. Well, sweet man. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So you're at M dot B dot Schwartz, but it's just yep. S W A R T Z. It's, it's not the easiest one to remember, but yeah, that's me. If you want to find me on Instagram and see, see what I'm up to. I, if you, I try and post stuff every now and again. If you just type MB, it prompts him. I don't know if yep. that's because I've searched him enough times or not, but I <laughs> might be thinking. <laughs> and then it's at Expedition Portal and at Overland Journal. Yep. That's All it. spelled regularly. All spelled the way you think they would be spelled. One well, word. <laughs> well, sweet. I'm going to wrap up the rest of the show. Yes. Uh, if you haven't yet, please rate and review us on iTunes. I'm now looking into apps that actually tell me the last time people have done that. And it's been a hot minute and we need mm -hmm. some more of those. Um, we're falling off in Cyprus again. Um, just, just Cyprus. That's just the, the, the single country of Cyprus. Yeah. We were really high ranked in Cyprus for automotive <laughs> and leisure, like ridiculously high. Wow. Like we did not belong really there. Really funny. <laughs> yeah. It's like two people really love this. Yeah. So <laughs> if you're listening to Cyprus, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. We'd love to off road with you. Uh, so you can follow Hooniverse, the Hooniverse on Twitter, the real Hooniverse on Instagram. You can read our writing on Hooniverse, UTV driver, ATV writer, everyday driver. Really, those are all Ross and I wrote something on Hooniverse recently. So yeah. <laughs> if you want, if you're curious about materials, uh, available for EV batteries, I wrote a post about that. Which, cool shit though. That, which, that's worth, worth a poke. Really, really like short synopsis. Uh, solar and wind is coming no matter what. Those technologies are going to be so cheap in the future. It's just coming. Like it's all about fucking time. It's the point where it doesn't matter what the governments like incentivize them. Like they're just going to be so cheap. It's coming no matter what. So mm -hmm. my self-sustaining farm has a shot. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Ross is at no, not like the one from friends. I'm at overlanding dad and we've done it. That's our show. Yeah. Oh, and this is total tangential, but my, my dad, the guy that got me into off-roading from the day I was born, having knee replacement surgery tomorrow. So want to wish him well. This will obviously air after a week after, after that. So. Uh, and he's doing a, great. Uh, fair chance that he hasn't listened, but we uh, <laughs> hope him a speedy recovery and get back I, into the, gets back into the razor very quickly after my brother and I unfuck its axles. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's definitely still something you need to fix. And also I hope he does listen, but with the good drugs. With the good drugs. Yeah, you will certainly be on the good drugs this time tomorrow night. My, my dad's had both knees done. We're good. Oh, has he? Okay, so we, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this. Later. I now know what I have to look forward to in my future. <sighs> yeah. Hopefully by the time I get them, they come with their own version of suspension. <laughs> like I want yeah. bionic knees. Like not just <laughs> knees. 
All of a sudden, you can jump six feet into the air. Yeah. You get a king sticker or like, yeah, exactly. Dude, I would put Fox on my leg. You know, I would like (laughs) Bill Stein uh, uh, 4,600. I I feel like I. I've made fun of Rancho being on the trail boss so many times now I can't say Rancho. Can't. You get a free no. knee. You just have to tattoo our logo right on your forehead. <laughs> Ooh, for- your forehead. If it was my okay. cap, no, no, I no, think no, that's no, a no, maybe, no. but like forehead, nah, hard pass. <laughs> like, you have to negotiate on that point. Right. Exactly. Oh my God. Sweet. Thanks, Matt. Oh man. Awesome. Man. Thanks for having Matt, me on, Thank guys. you. I appreciate that it. That was fun. Yep. That was great. I learned a lot of shit tonight. I never knew that much. I never even knew anything about anything off the ground. <laughs>